Final Fantasy XIII is a good game. I know you'd be hard pressed to find a post on the internet that doesn't have comments saying 13 is great, and then right next to it, someone else spouting their hatred of the hallway simulator that is 13. And honestly, I would say that most of these praises and criticisms are valid. I just replayed the game on PlayStation 3 this winter with the goal not to only complete the story, but also platinum the game which made me complete all of the endgame trials and side quests. And while not all of the endgame was enjoyable, and we'll get to that later, the 55 hours or so that I did spend in the game proper were great. Before we get into the game, I want to go over the world of Final Fantasy XIII. There's a lot of backstory and funky terms like Falsy and CF being talked about throughout the journey to save the world. All of this is explained as you play, and there is a very large data log going into way more detail than I think anyone could have asked for. But I'm not going to explain the whole story over the course of this video, so let's just get the basics out of the way first. The game takes place primarily on Cocoon, which is essentially a tiny artificial planet that hovers above a huge planet called Grand Pulse. Many thousands of years ago, there was a big war between the people of Cocoon and the people of Pulse. And even to this day, the people of Cocoon live in fear of another Pulse invasion even though no one on Cocoon has actually even seen or heard from the Pulsion people since the war. Behind the scenes, we also have a giant cast of gods, or they may be more akin to something like an archangels called Falsies, which tend to the needs of the humans living on Cocoon. Everything from their food supply, the weather, and keeping it afloat. People on Cocoon are extremely dependent on Falsies to support and protect them. But that also has its drawbacks, as Falsies have the ability to enlist unwilling humans to serve their will and are marked with a brand. These branded humans are called Lucy. They are gifted with the ability to use magic, but are compelled to complete a task known as a focus. Unfortunately for some Lucy, their focus is not always explained forthright to them, which makes completing their focus rather difficult. If they manage to complete their focus, that person is granted eternal life and turned into a crystal. People that are either unwilling or unable to complete the focus that was tasked to them will eventually turn into CF. Creatures who are robbed of free will and are damned to wander the world, unliving and undying. Cocoon, however, is not the only place Falsies exist. Pulse also has its fair share of these demigod-like beings that can force humans into doing their bidding, and even a thousand years later, there are many places on Cocoon that have Pulsion remnants and artifacts left over from the war. And with all that background is where we start our journey. Final Fantasy XIII does not waste any time getting started. We find ourselves on a train with Lightning, the no-nonsense soldier slash main character, and Saz, a chocobo hair housing dad. These two are trying to stop a train from completing its trip to purge the citizens of Bodom, and from the looks of the train's surroundings, they are actually not the only ones trying to rescue the inhabitants of this purge-bound train. The Cocoon government presents the Purge as a voluntary exile to the lower world of Grand Pulse for everyone that has come in contact with the Pulse Fell Sea. On behalf of Cocoon citizens, I would like to thank our brave Pulse pioneers and express our best wishes for a successful relocation. Your noble and selfless sacrifice ensures the continued safety and peace of our society. People volunteer to leave their home to keep Cocoon safe from anything Pulse related. This, however, is not the truth, and the Sanctum does not exile people who have come in contact with Pulsion Falsi, but executes them instead. Lightning and Saz team up, and as we find out a little later, is to help each other find Lightning's sister Sarah and Saz's son, Dodge. As the two attempt to find their loved ones, a group of rebels fight to also stop the purge train, which introduces Snow. He wants to be a hero, and he's basically the Zell of Final Fantasy XIII. He punches. You stay here. So sorry. I didn't mean to. These people need heroes. Snow is a part of the resistance group Nora, or No Obligations, Rules, or Authority. Nora is trying to save the people from the seemingly not-so-volunteer event that is the Purge, and Snow is also trying to find and save his fiancée, Sarah, who, you might have guessed it, is also Lightning's sister. The newly freed Purge train passengers join the fight alongside Nora, and one of them, a mother, who is also named Nora, Moms are tough. 
Unfortunately, this goes south for the mother Nora, who was killed when helping Snow. But not before she asks him to make sure her son Hope is safe. Hope, however, witnesses Snow's cavalier attitude and actions and blames Snow for his mother's death. Hope is joined by Vanille, a quirky young lady who at the moment is just seemingly along for the ride. As the Sanctum moves the Pulse Foul Sea through the area, the growing cast of characters heads towards it as we come to the end of Chapter 1. This is where I want to try and leave the main story beat description. I think 13 has a good overall story, and instead of explaining it all, I just wanted to get the first chapter out of the way to introduce the main characters and the initial driving forces behind their journey. We'll talk about it a little bit more when I talk about the battle system, since the mechanics are based on the story arc, but for now, this is what we know. Lightning is a badass lady of few words looking for her sister Sarah. Saz is staying as close to Lightning as possible to stay as alive as possible to find his son. Snow is a self-proclaimed hero out to save his bride-to-be. Hope is in hot pursuit of Snow to confront him for the death of his mother. And Vanille tags along with Hope because she wants to help him find his courage. The combat system is slowly introduced in Final Fantasy XIII throughout the course of the first few chapters. In the first chapter, the party only has the basics available to them, with only auto battle, some limited abilities such as attack and blitz, and the items command available from the start. This will get broadened to become a fully fleshed out battle system as time goes on, but in Chapter 1, 13's battle system isn't much more than hit auto battle unless you need to use a potion. In battle, you only fully control the lead character, and the other party members just use their AI minds to fight the good fight. If the character you are controlling happens to lose all of their HP, they don't just die, however. It's game over, so pay attention. How can it end like this? You will receive a star rating of up to 5 stars at the end of each battle. Essentially this ranking helps determine rare drops, refills some battle gauges, and gives you validation about how good at slaying Psycom soldiers and beasties you are. Also different from previous Final Fantasies is your HP is refilled after each battle, so there is no need to heal your characters if they barely survived or even if a party member died during the last encounter. Battles in 13 are supposed to feel hard, arduous, and threatening throughout the whole game. Many boss battles and even regular dungeon fights can be challenging if you don't approach them with certain strategies. 13 introduces the Paradigm System, which allows you to set broad actions for each character selected from six different roles. Each Paradigm you create has you pick a role for each of the characters in your party. Not all roles are available to all party members the whole game, and not all characters are equally skilled in each role. While Snow is a great sentinel, he's not the greatest Ravager, and while Hope is a great Ravager, he is one hell of a turd-filled commando. Eventually, all roles do open up for each character, but through the bulk of the main story, your characters will specialize in two or three roles, while another character picks up where the other ones are weak. There are six roles to choose from. The Ravager role is essentially your black magic damage dealer. Commandos are your physical damage dealers. Saboteurs specialize in slapping debuffs onto your enemies, while synergists work the opposite side and buff up your party members. Sentinels are literally designed to be human shields and draw in the enemy's attacks. And finally, you got your healer role, the Medic. You can create a total of six paradigms for battle and switch in between them at any moment to better suit your needs at any given time. So before when I said you control the main character and you just trust the other party members' little computer brains to battle by your side, that was half true. The paradigms let you change the focus of your party's actions from dealing certain types of damage to buffing up your party while a sentinel protects the others to an all-out medic emergency healing session. The way these paradigms are set up and how you utilize them in battle will truly determine the challenge this game presents. There are battles not only in the end game but also in the main storyline that if you don't prepare a proficient set of paradigms beforehand, you will lose, or at the very least, struggle through a slow, tormenting battle. Since for most of the game you are not strong enough to end a battle in just a couple hits, the focus is on you staggering your enemies. As the party attacks an enemy, a chain bonus builds up until the enemy's staggering point is reached, after which the party has a limited amount of time to deal extra damage to the enemy. Some of the rolls also have different effects on the chain gauge. Ravagers build up the gauge fast, but commandos can slow down the gauge from depleting. 
which means using these in tandem actually helps you achieve stagger more efficiently than if you were to only use, say, Ravagers on an enemy. There is a lot of nuance and depth to the battle system in 13, and if you spend the time to understand even the basic ins and outs of what each role does and how they work together, then your gaming life while playing 13 will become easier and more enjoyable. I can say that there were many times that I was struggling with a boss fight, and when I retried with a different paradigm setup for my party, it was like I was Neo understanding the code in the Matrix and all was clear in that moment. It honestly usually just meant that I used a sentinel in my party paradigm. Don't sleep on sentinels, they're legit and they will carry you to victory on their backs uphill both ways. As you progress further into 13, most people will see that the area maps for the vast majority of the game are linear, with only slight path deviations leading to a treasure sphere on occasion, but not much else. In fact, up until chapter 11 where the group flees Cocoon for the wide open area of the Archolite Step on Grand Pulse, there is truly no exploration outside of the given path available to the player. And even then, the exploration will most likely need to be held off until after the main story is completed. Is this bad? Is 13 not a good Final Fantasy game in part because of its forced linearity? It's definitely different. Some on the internet would like you to believe this to be true. However, was 15 a great Final Fantasy game just because of its massive open world? I would honestly say that the open world of 15 was almost more of a hindrance to that game than a feather in its cap. I believe the reason that 13 is looked down on as a linear hallway simulator is that it doesn't actually try to hide this. The first 10 chapters of 13 are essentially an elongated getaway scene. The characters are fugitives fleeing from the government while trying to uncover the truth and make sense of what has just happened to them. There isn't time in the story to stop at the gold saucer for chocobo racing. They don't have time to explore an out-of-the-way tomb which may hold an ancient powerful summon they can utilize. They are trying to stay alive by pushing forward, and with the commitment to this story, the game developers have not included some normal Final Fantasy elements like towns or larger area maps. I think this change works well for 13, but I can understand how someone coming from something like the hugely explorable NPC and town-filled Final Fantasy XII would play 13 and be turned off. So yes, 13 has a lot of area maps that are just linear paths. But I believe that is because the creators are pushing us through the story. Using even the map and dungeon layouts suppress a sense of urgency. There's no time to dawdle and explore. We must continue onward. As I mentioned earlier, you start the game off only being able to use attack and items in battle. At the end of chapter 2, the party is branded by the Pulse Falci Anima, which leads to the party becoming Lissy and being able to use paradigms, utilize specific roles, and magic in battle. In Chapter 3, the player is finally able to use the Crystarium, which is Final Fantasy XIII's level up system. Each one of the character's roles has a separate Crystarium that is set up like a connect the dots path system of skills to learn, hit points to accrue, and other stat increases to acquire. Each character's Crystarium is unique, and not all characters can learn the same skills. Vanille is the only character that can learn the Saboteur's death skill, but is also the only character that cannot learn haste from the Synergist role. These small deviations and skill sets started to dictate who I would pick in my later game party, especially when it came to the endgame missions, which I will talk about in just a little bit. Idolins, the summons of Final Fantasy XIII, come to those struggling with C in a time of need or hopelessness, and help the party members with the focus they are tasked to complete. All six party members have a moment of self-doubt right before a chosen Eidolon makes itself known to them. Naturally, before the Eidolon lends its power to the character, it must be defeated. The first Eidolon we are introduced to are the Shiva sisters, who help slash challenge Snow at the end of Chapter 3. Also, every Eidolon has a vehicle form which is just silly. Odin turns from a fierce knight into a horse that lightning can ride. Vanille's Hecaton turns into Magitek armor and the Shiva sisters turn into the most awkward motorcycle for anyone to ride. Let's ride. After you defeat an Eidolon, you can use TP or Technique points to summon them in battle. I didn't talk about TP in the battle section earlier, but you are granted certain abilities your party leader can use in battle such as Libra or Quake. You can have up to 5 TP bars saved, and they will recharge over time by defeating enemies in battle. While Eidolons are a beautiful spectacle to show off and admire, I started to feel like the cost of summoning them at 3 TP soon outweighs their usefulness in battle when you get farther into the story. 
So the only one I used on a regular basis was Vanille's Hecaton to stagger Adamantoises while I was grinding in the endgame. Once you get through the last dungeon of the game, you have an option to teleport back to Grand Pulse and do some of the side missions and further character development. If you're going for the Platinum Trophy or 100% of the achievements, then this means fully completing all of your character's Crystariums, holding every weapon and accessory in the game, and completing all 64 CF Stone missions with a 5-star battle rating, which pit you against the game's toughest monsters. If I may vent for a second, the Treasure Hunter Trophy in Final Fantasy XIII is terrible and bad and it shouldn't exist, and one of the only examples of gameplay mechanics fitting into the story and the world that I am not a fan of. What you need to do is hold or have held every weapon and accessory in the game. A couple things needed for this are upgrade materials, insane amounts of gill, and the luck to have not missed any unique treasure spheres along the way. The latter isn't actually too bad since the maps throughout the story are not that expansive, and it's pretty hard not to see a treasure sphere if you're paying any modicum of attention to your surroundings. Obtaining most of the upgrade materials comes naturally and are available pretty easily if you know where to look except for the rarer materials which force you to fight higher level beasts in hopes that their menial drop rates will be in your favor. Honestly, this is nothing a couple episodes of Star Trek Voyager can't solve. You'd prefer I spent my time with more sociable individuals, such as yourself. You could do worse. But obtaining gill in this game can only be done by finding it in treasure spheres or selling items. Monsters do not drop gill. And this is obviously true to what would actually happen in the world of Final Fantasy XIII, but damn if this doesn't just annoy the hell out of me. I don't have any issue with a wolf dropping a bag of coins if it will cut down on my endgame grind of fighting Adamantois and Longui just so they will drop rare trapezohedrons that I can sell and have enough gill to upgrade all of my weapons and accessories in the game. I honestly think I fought in the Archolite step for 25 or more hours grinding for CP to max out my characters and farming for materials to use and to sell. I am sure I did not do this in the most efficient way, but I know I didn't do it in the worst way. While I still had characters to level up, the grind didn't seem so bad. But after all my characters' Crystariums were completed, and I had all of the CF missions completed with 5 stars, the journey to get Saws, a character I hadn't used in over 30 hours, another weapon, just to get one step closer to this obnoxious trophy, is when I was ready to stop my quest to Platinum 13. I can say without any hesitation that unless you're a trophy hunter or a completionist, this is a task that can be left alone. The other main end game endeavor is to complete all the CF missions with a 5 star rating. This is definitely the most challenging aspect of my Final Fantasy XIII journey. You can start knocking out CF stone missions when they are introduced in Chapter 11, but many are too powerful for your party during your first visit and they need to be tackled after the main story is complete. This is when your true mastery of the battle system will be tested, and helps you understand the importance of the all-sentinel paradigm, Tortoise. While getting 5 stars in all of these missions may not be everyone's cup of tea, I would highly suggest trying to take down all of these monsters at least once, as I think it gave me an appreciation for just how versatile the battle system can be, and all the various tactics one needs to defeat the monsters Grand Pulse has to throw at you. In total, I spent over 100 hours with Final Fantasy XIII. The first 55 of those hours were taken up by the main storyline of the game, and the latter 50-ish hours was spent fighting CF marks and grinding for materials. While by no means did I enjoy all of the endgame material, I did thoroughly enjoy my time spent with lighting in that ragtag cast of fugitives she found herself traveling with to save the world. I think if you're a fan of Final Fantasy and you can see past the hallway to the great battle system, the likable cast of characters and excellent story, then you should give this game a chance. I even started to like hope by the end of this game, and I'm not going to start with the story now, but he sucked in the beginning. Even as a more linear JRPG, this game goes on my recommendation list to those of you that have lasted this long in the video, and for you self-loathing completionists out there like me. It's a treacherous journey, but it's a doable one.